Okay, so how many of you would like to go to production with an application that is beautiful, responsive, scalable, highly concurrent, resilient, you know, yada yada, right? Raise your hand, yeah. Guess what though? I mean, none of that matters unless your application is actually up. <laughs> unless, it's, unless it's actually available, okay? So it really starts and ends with resilience. Without resilience, nothing else matters, really. And that is sort of the, the theme for this, for this talk. Most of you probably recognize this song that I tried to have, like, sort of the, sort of the soundtrack for this talk. That is, that is sort of the first, uh, anyone know, know it, by the way? Uh, so we're giving, give, give, I'm giving you some hints here. It's from the first uh, Rocky movie, the, the, the theme song from, some, some, from like in the 70s. And you know, Rocky is about this underdog, you know, they call him the Italian Stallion. He gets a shot at the title. And, uh, you know, it's uh, one of the most memorable quotes from this, from this series. But it ain't about how hard it's you hit. One. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. And, you know, this is fault tolerance. It's really, I mean, you will take a shot, right, and, and, and you, you might limp along, and hopefully, eventually, you will win. Right? But it's really, that's not really a sustainable strategy. Fault tolerance, even though we, we, so we talk a lot about it in, in computer science and so on, it's not really a, sust a sustainable strategy. I really believe that we need, we need, we need to think beyond that and, 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 tr and try to strive for resilience. Resilience is really something that is beyond fault tolerance. It's not just to like, you know, get hit and limp along and bleed some and, and hopefully, I mean, you will win anyway. Right? So, so, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about and try to dive down to what, what resilience really, really means. Why it looks like for like what it is, why it's needed, how we can learn from other sort of fields of science and industries and, and how they sort of manage resilience. You know, our, our industry as in computer science is, is, re is really, really young and we have a lot to learn from many other industries like in, and, and, and fields. And also like from nature, like it's been around for, for billions of years or millions of years, depending on how, how you look at it. So, so what is resilience? Uh, Mary Webster, the online dictionary, sort of d defines resilience as the ability of a substance and object to spring back into shape, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's really to be able to fully restore full functionality, not just to, to like limp along and, and, and sort of keep up. It's really to, to like heal fully and be able to, to, to go back to where you were before you had a failure or an outage and so on. Not just survive. And you know, systems today, they are incredibly complex. I mean, software systems. And these are just two sort of images that were circling around the, in, the internet the last uh, like six, six months. It's like from the Netflix, the, the Netflix and the Twitter architectures. And, and I really believe that software systems in general are incredibly complex. And I think that we need to, we have a lot to learn Rock, from studying resilience in complex systems and, what, and, what, and, what, and really what that means. So first, what is complex and how is it different from, from, from complicated? So this is a complicated system. A complicated system is, is usually defined by, it has many small parts, all of them are, are different, and each one has sort of a precise role in the machinery, a, spe a special function. And it's, it's like usually possible, but it's, it can be hard, but usually possible to fully understand a, com a complicated system. And someone, like an expert, can usually know exactly what's going on. But a complex system, it's usually made, it's very different, it's usually made of very many like similarly interacting parts. And, and you have like, in each one of these like live by sort of, sort of very simple rules. And it's, and it's together, I mean that they together and the relationship and how they interact together that leads to like a globally co co coherent behavior. And, and it's by definition impossible to understand a complex system. And this is, by the way, so you, I'm sure you, most, most of you recognize, this is the, the game, game of life. And, and, like, and like, if you look at it in isolation, it's, it's, it's very predictable. It's extremely simple. You know, the game of life was like sort of defined by Conway. Uh, no, no, not Conway. Who was it? Yeah. Yeah, it is Conway, yeah. Uh, 
and 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 it has a very like very like think like four or five sim, very very sim, simple rules. But when you put them together, and they start interacting, like in this like complicated uh, version of it, it 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 really real. I mean, it com it becomes almost completely unpredictable and completely impossible to understand. So this is really a good example of a complex system. So complicated is really not equal to complex, even though we often like confuse the terms, and I've did, I've done so myself. And it's and it's and it's so this is probably the most important sort of piece of knowledge that I learned when doing research for for, the, for this talk. I found this in this great paper, "How Complex Systems Fail," by Richard Cook, where he said that complex systems run in degraded mode. Complex systems they always run as broken systems, because in a, in a, in a non-trivial complex system, something is always failing somewhere. That's a fact. I mean, we just need to accept that. And that's why I think we need to like, rethink how we deal with failure and need better strategies to deal with it. And, as, and as, I will, as I will come back to many times in this talk, there's nothing exceptional about failure. Even though I'm in Java and C and C++ and C, um, C Sharp, Scala, we call them exceptions. But there's really nothing exceptional about failure. It's something natural. And if you think about it that way, it will, it will completely change the way we, you deal with it because then you design with, with the, you know, the fact that failure is something that will happen and it's and natural. And, it, and then if you end up in that state, you, the, the failed state, if you have planned for it and have a good, it's like part of your workflow really and how it's predicted that to happen, then you know exactly how to get out of it, right? You, you, you're in the start phase. You, I mean, you, you, you might get resumed. You might get stopped and upgraded. Now you're in the failed phase. I mean, no problem. You know exactly how to get out of that. And there's nothing exceptional about that. And it, another thing is like humans just usually just makes it worse. And, and, and this, is, this is from a, a great paper called Leverage Points by Donella Meadows. And he, you know, she's, she's, she's one of the experts. She was one of the experts in, in systems thinking. And, when, and she writes about it, I mean, points for human intervention, where humans like go in, you know, turn the knobs in a complex system. And I'll, this is a, a quote from that paper, and I, and I, and I quote, counterintuitive, that's how Jay Forrester's word to describe complex systems. Leverage points are not intuitive, or if they are, we as humans intuitively use them backwards, systematically worsening whatever problems we are trying to solve. And the reason is simply because, you know, as she says, they... I mean, we as humans are not used to think about things like this. I mean, we, we usually just make things worse by, by, by trying to fix things. So I really believe that we need good models to think about failure and, 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 and also how to deal with it. And, and I, I, one model where I, that I think was really good for, to explain this, this sort of the, this, the psychology for, around, around failure when it comes to humans was this model that I learned from, also from Richard, Richard Cook. It's a couple of links here. It, by the way, I have all the links at the end of, this, of the session if you want to dive down deeper or, or just check facts. So according to Richard Cook, we are always operating at the, at the, at the edge of failure. Richard Cook, by the way, he was, he's an MD. Uh, doing, uh, he's been doing research in medical systems for, for more than 20 years, and really with the focus of resilience. When do things go wrong in medical systems? Like patients die or, or, or things like that. And how can we prevent and learn from that? Okay. And, this, and this model that I'm going to go walk through now is defined by his, by his colleague Rasmussen in 1997. And in this model, you have sort of three different boundaries. First, you have the economic failure, failure boundary. Then you, have, then you have what is called the unacceptable workload boundary. And, the, and then you have what is, what, what is called the accident boundary. And you know, the, in the, the economic failure boundary is, is, is sort of describes that you, as a business, we will, will always try to stay within this boundary. Because if you, if you, if you cross the economic failure boundary, then, you, then, then, then we go out of business, essentially. <laughs> the, the unacceptable workload boundary defines, you know, when we cross this boundary, then, we, then people fall asleep or, or can't, can't produce productive work, essentially. And that actually happens, you know, in battlefield situations, people like, they run around until they really fall asleep or like startup situations, you know, people pushing one or or whatever. And, and then you have the accident boundary. And if you cross this boundary, then you fail for some definition of failure. It can be like, you know, a patient dies. Or it can be like, um, like there is an outage or, 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 or something like this. 
right? And then you have an operating point, and these operating points are moving between these, these boundaries, and, it, and it's constantly moving, and, and it, sort of, <clears throat> sort of, it, it sort of has to move. And, and then if you cross the accident boundary again, then you have a failure, okay? <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing now, what makes this operating point move is that we have three different pressures. First, we have like management sort of pressure towards economic efficiency. We want to get as far away from the, from, the, from, the, from the economic failure boundary as possible. I mean, that's, that's dangerous. I mean, and, and, and because, we, you, of course, you never want to go out of business and you want to be as efficient as possible to like, maximize revenue and stuff like that. And then you naturally have a technology sort of a gradient toward le least effort. I mean, we as humans, we of course, we, don't, we never want to do more than absolutely necessary. We're always lazy, we want to go home or, or like hack on some open source instead of this, finding this, this, you know, this, this really gnarly bug. And, and these two together like, tends to push the operating point towards the accident boundary. And, and, and after a while, we sort of, we sort of get this. We, 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 we actually do cross it, right? And, and, and then everyone panics, and we, and we, we start like, I mean, adding new policies, or like perhaps like rewriting the system, or, 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 uh, or some rules, or whatever. You know? And then we forget about it, and, and, it, and then we repeat. So, so the, the, the question is then, if we have this drifting all the time, how come we don't have failures constantly? It's usually because we, we intuitively add what is called an error margin. That's sort of a stop sign, you know, or like, or sort of like sort of, sort, of, sort of speed sign on the roads, right? You should not go above 80 kilometers per hour because that's, that's risky, for example. Or, or we should not use more resources than whatever. We should not allow, allow and more than like 2,000 concurrent customers or something like, like that. And, and when we then get closer to this, to this sort of error margin, then we know we're now we're entering risky territory and, and we better beware, essentially. So now, if we have this error margin, then how can we still continue to fail on and on again? Okay? It's, 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 it's because we, you know, we know a lot about the marginal boundary, because we defined it. But we usually have really no clue where the accident boundary is. And, 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 so, so, and you know, this, this constant sort of push towards economic efficiency means that we, we like try to cross this, this, this margin. So we, we, we just do it one time and see. I mean, it, so it actually worked, but I, trust, I, step, I step back, okay, nothing bad happened. And then we do it again, you know, and then, oh, nothing bad happened, right? And then, and then we've been crossing this boundary for so many times that it sort of, it just feels natural. So then we just say, okay, why don't we just, we've been doing this for like six months now on and off. We can just operate this way. And, and then we move the accident, the, 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 sort of the marginal boundary towards the accident boundary until, you know, they become the same and we have an, 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 an outage again. And this is what is called, <laughs> uh, sort of less formally for like flirting with the margin and more formally uh, normalization of deviance. It was actually Diane, uh, a girl, a woman called Diane Vaughan that defined this, this term when she, when she wrote about you know, the challenger launch decision. You are, uh, m most of you, the people that are as old as me, at least remember, you know, the challenger rocket ship that sort of blew, blew, blew up. And the reason was essentially that the marginal boundary was like pushed so, so close towards the accident boundary that it crashed and people died. So this was sort of a, real, a really nice model for me to understand how the sort of the psychology for failure and how come we, we get that all the time. So now if, if if, if software systems are so incredibly complex, then, and, and, and complex systems always run as broken systems, and we always operate on the edge of failure, then I believe that we really need to learn to embrace failure, as I said. It's nothing exceptional about failure. It's something natural. We need to design for failure and find a nice way of managing it. So really, the most fundamental lesson, really, that I'll try to teach you today, and that I learned the hard way, is that resilience is by design. It's really nothing that you can bolt on afterwards. Like, like I've done way too many times. Or like turn on like, you know, web logic clustering or something if you run an app server and just hope for the best. Or like bring in some other tools. You know, we all, too, way too often in our industry, we just try to fix things by adding stuff. Like, yeah, like more and more and more and more stuff. And then things like fail. I mean, why are we even surprised, right? I mean, I, 
like probably a phase from the pressure of all this stuff, right? The building collapsing. This is, I think, this is one of my favorite pictures actually uh, in this in this whole slide deck. is 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 from this home in G Gilchrist, Texas. It was designed to dis to like resist floodwaters, and it was one of the few houses that survived Hurricane Ike. It was one of you, one of all these hurricanes they had in the U.S. Uh, in 2008. And it's really, as you can see, I mean, it's really designed for, for, for failure. It's resilient by design. So let's now take a look at how, how some, some other like, fields are, are managing fail, failure uh, and how, what, we can learn, what we can learn from that. So first, starting with resilience in, bio, in biological systems. So one of these interesting stories that I, that, that I sort of found when I was doing research around resilience uh, for, for this talk was by this, this, it was this TED talk. I mean, look it up afterwards, take a look. I think it was a really interesting one. It was this guy called Nin Nicholas Peroni. He talks about complexity theory and he, he's doing research on animals and how animals like, behave. And it, this story was, was about these, these, these meerkats and, 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 and how they naturally sort of gravitate towards the resilient behavior. And personally, I just, I just love meerkats. I think they are extremely interesting and fascinating. They're, 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 they're cute and they have, they have these, they're in, so living in this extremely complex social uh, sort of say interactions, you know, they, the family mean, means a lot to them and they have extremely complex behaviors. I mean, very, very, very human-like actually. And one, one of them is that it's, the, it's only the dominant couple in a group that is allowed to get babies, actually. All the other ones should, should just work as servants. So like, like babysitters, essentially. Well, I don't know what, 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 what the parents do then. I mean, they're probably having a good time. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so in this experiment, it was a GPS trackers where it was added to the dominant female. And, and the whole group was, was observed moving from one for feeding place to the other one. It was, and there was a road in between. And, 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 the, and it was observed that it was, it, was, it was a dominant female that sort of led the group up, so on for like forward until she reached the road, and then she stopped, and she, she and then she like waited for for the, for her sort of servants like to to try to cross the road for him for her right and see I mean are they doing did they like make it okay or were they like hit, like run over by a truck no everything went fine okay then I can cross and then the whole group crossed right and it's actually I mean it's really fascinating because nature sort of developed this over thousands of years. You know, you know the, the dominant female is extremely important to the group. If she dies, the whole group is at risk because she's the only one that can have babies. And, 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 and sort of this, this sort of pattern or idea of like delegating dangerous work to subordinates is something that I think we can learn a lot from. And I'll come back to that later when I talk about software. So, and, 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 and Nicholas Peroni, he sums up his TED talk with this, with this quote that I also think is really interesting. In three words, in the animal kingdom, simplicity leads to complexity, which leads to resilience. Mm -hmm. It's really a cry out for simplicity, more simple systems. And through that, I think we have a better chance of, re of really architecting resilient systems. So the, the other example I want to go through was resilience in social systems. This, this was from a paper that was sent to me by a friend. Uh, that's, 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 that's doing a lot of, you know, research and work in like, in like environmental, um, like you know, sort of resilient systems, you know, in 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 the sorry, in the environment and and and, uh, and and that type of things. And it's from it's from a, if you want to look it up, it's called Dealing in in Insecurity by Bennett and Gupta here. And and it's really about there are six ways to die, essentially. And these are the, the pie slices here. Like you have hunger, being too cold, too hot, injury, illness, or thirst. These are the six ways we, we humans can die. Okay? And then you have three sets of essential services that protect us from dying. We have, we have, we, we have shelter that, 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 that protects us from being like too hot and too cold. We have supply, you know, stuff. That, that protects us from, from dying from hunger or from thirst. And then we have safety that, that, that prevents us from illness, Ill, illness and injury. And these services are laid out in layers, right? This is like our, the world we live in today, like everyone. We, don't, we just don't think about it like this. So we have seven layers of infrastructure, seven layers of protection that protects us, us from dying. From the, from the top one here, 
<clears throat> we have the, first we have the world, you know, that's like things like markets, like energy markets, food markets, fuel markets. You know, then we have the country, it can be like, the, you know, the military. Then we have region, that is sort of the police and stuff like that. City can be a hospital, water plants and things like this. In the neighborhood, yeah, we have like food shops and stuff like that. At home, we have like heating, toilet, you know, we have the refrigerator and stuff like that. And then, then all the way back to the individual. And, and so we have this, these, these layers that protect us, right? And it, it, so, so the idea is that you should take like quite a lot of failure in all these layers to, to, I mean, to, to sort of for us as individuals to die, essentially. And in, at least in, like, in the Western world, that usually works really well. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the world around us, right? And also I think this is something that we, should, we, should, we, 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 that we can learn a lot from. I, I call this, uh, I'm actually, when I'm applying this, this, this principle, I call this sort of, sort of the error kerning pattern. I'll get back to that later in the talk, okay? So what, what can be, if we, if we like something up, what can be learned from biological and resilient systems in general? <clears throat> they usually feature diversity and, re, and, re, and, re, and redundancy. You know, systems that are written with many components are usually more resilient than, 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 than ones that are written with a few because it means that like, certain components can like, take over work from others, from others, you know, and, and, and compensate from the failure in, in, in others. And we, we usually call it like, don't put all the eggs in the same basket, essentially. <coughs> the, these systems, they also tend to have like, a very interconnected network structure, and also the sort of display a wide di distribution of structures across uh, scale, all kinds of scales, like from fine grain out to coarse grain. And they also have the capacity to self-adapt, to learn, and to self-organize, right? You have this aut autonomous, uh, sort of components that can that can sort of behave in isolation and collaborate to 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 learn behaviors. So this brings me to resilience in com in, com in computer systems. So unfortunately, I mean, most of us sort of most very often we I mean I've seen people react like this. And of course not you, right? But 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 um, all other ones or the other people, <laughs> you know, like first not at all, and then we like complete panic. You know, freaking out. And, and I really think that there's reason for this, because we really fundamentally need to change the way we think about failure. Again, like failure is inevitable, right? It will happen. It's something natural, once again. Nothing exceptional. We need to design for failure and learn to manage it. And, and a lot of people here have probably heard about you know, the let it crash philosophy. It was like popularized by Erlang. And in this great model to, to, to work with you wrote reactor systems that I, that I do. I mean, Erling and Aka sort of embrace that. But so if we take a look at what that really means, then there are a couple of great papers that I, that I uh, want to like, recommend. And the first one is, is actually called Crash Only Software. It's, it's a paper by Kanji and Fox here. And, 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 they, and they, they, they present this really simple idea, you know, that, that sort of stop is essentially just crash but crash safely. And start is just recover fast. Okay, so, so, and, uh, so, uh, so embracing this model gives you a really nice, sort of, sort of, sort of easy way to deal with failure. It's sort of a sledgehammer, you know, like bang, and then we're, and then, and then we're back up. But I really believe that that sort of philosophy is something to really have, to have, to have in mind. But, it, but they also, I mean, they, they took this idea further in this, in this other paper, rec that's called Recursive rest Restartability, turning the reboot sledgehammer into, to, into scalpel, where they, where, where they talk about applying these, these, these crash-only patterns recursively, like, like all the way from the finest grain component all the way up to, to the coarse grain. I mean, from, from your component, like within the microservice, for example, if you write, if you write microservices, all up to the microservice, up to the node level, all the way up to the, to the, to the machine level. And, and if you do that, I mean, you, you really get a system that has the ability to, to, to like gracefully tolerate restarts at, 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 at any level. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a really nice way to look at, to look at it, because, because what, it, what, what it does, it, like, it gives you a nice way to like reset your state to the to a known stable state because you know almost all failures relate to some sort of state. I mean, it can be like inconsistent state because it's in data, partial data, wrong data. I mean, lost data, duplicated data, <clears throat> and so on. And and so, if if I will try to like sort of classify the, the different types 
of state. And this, this, this also great paper, Out of the Tar Pit, sort of explains it and sort of defines that you, it in the way that you have, you, just, you have sort of two types, only two types of state. You have sort of the input state, that is the critical state. That is the state that's given to you from your customers, for example, or from a third party that you just, if you lose that, I mean, it's really impossible to get that back unless you go out to the customer and ask them to fill in the form again or I'll call out to the third party and try to get it again. <coughs> so this is the, the key state. And then we have derived state. Everything else is derived state. There is a derived from that. That's recomputable. Okay? So it's really only the input data that is essential. Okay? So now, in traditional so state management, if I would try to like draw here an, sort of an obit graph, and the, the legend here says, so, like, so the, the white ball here is sort of the client, and the blue ball here is sort of an object, and this, this square, red square here, that's critical state, the state that you can't lose, okay? And then you have this, this dotted line, red line, that's, this, uh, that's the thread boundary, and I'll get back to why that, why that matters. Okay, so then you have this, this interconnected object graph, like doing some, I mean, fulfilling some sort of service on behalf of the customer. And now, now let's say that, we have, that the customer comes in here and it does a request. Okay, and, and, and that's sort of, that sort of trickles some sort of behavior. I mean, from one object to the next to the next. Now, what's, what, what is happening here now, if, if that is sort of, as most systems now, actually doing that, that sort of that, that request chain using synchronous dispatch, you know, in one single thread. Now, if, 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 if one of these components goes, goes down, I mean, the whole thread, sort of the whole stack is just, is just blown all the way up to the, to the client. Because all, all, all sort of requests here between the components are, synch are synchronous. That, our thread boundary sort of, like sort of covers the whole sort of, um, the whole service essentially. The problem here is that, is that I really believe that this is really completely, utterly broken. But it's still the way we, we, are, like, we are like learned, we, we have learned to deal with failure, with failure management. It's like the, sort of the recommended or the default way that we do things in Java, C, C++, and so on. <laughs> and the, the problem is that the, since this thread, you know, that we're using now for computation, it's the only context we have. We just need to hold on to it so hard because it's the only thing we have. So because if we if we if we don't if we lose it, you know, we lose all context about the failure or what's actually what was going on in the system. And 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 and, and this is why, you know, we need we need to essentially add try catch statements everywhere, because something can go wrong everywhere in the system, and we always need to be ready to to like grab that failure, and and because else the failure is lost and the whole context of the computation is lost. And this, and this leads to extremely defensive programming, with, you know, with, with the business logic is sort of completely tangled with, with, with error handling, and, and that's usually scattered across the whole application. And I really, really believe that that's completely wrong. I mean, I mean there are a lot better ways to, to do this. And so I said, look, we can learn a lot from nature and from other sciences in order to do that well. And I really believe that some structure here can actually bring sanity back. Because as Sidney Decker said in this, this, in, this, in this great book, is that accidents come from relationships, really, not broken parts. And I really believe that the requirements for, for like a sane failure mo model, not mode, should be model. Yeah, anyway, sane failure model. Uh, that means a sort of an escape route from that, you know, the utterly broken way that we've been taught. Is really that failures need to first be able to be contained. I mean, they need to be co compartmentalized. They cannot leak because if they leak, you, you get these cascading failures from, like, from one component to the next, to the next, to the next. And if you run a distributed system like most do today, you can actually start taking down node after node after node until your whole, your, 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 your whole data center is down. And you see that way too many times. So failure needs to be contained. It cannot leak unless you ask it to, right? And then you have a chance, actually, to manage the failure from, from, a, healthy, in, from a, like a healthy context outside. That context, that component failed, right? But, but I'm still fine. I'm kicking, you know? And I can actually, I, I, I was just notified. Now I have a chance to actually do something about that. 
I know about it and I can act. And, 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 and uh, so that together with, uh, you know, let, let, let me take one step back. So first, I mean, the isolation part then. It's really something that is also very natural to a lot of, to a lot of, under, lot, lot, lot of other industries. Is, 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 for example, how the ship industry has been dealing with failure management for a long, long time. They call it the, bul the, the bulkhead pattern, the bulkheading. And, and it's like, it's, it's, the idea is that in a ship, you, you like split it up into different compartments. And each one is completely isolated from the next. So, so if, if one is sort of getting ripped up, get, that gets filled up with water, all the elements are fine, right? It will take quite a lot of these guys to, to, to actually sink, sink the ship. Okay, now when I, whenever I talk about this, there's always someone that, someone that raises their hand and says, yeah, what about the Titanic? No, it's the reserve. I mean, it simply didn't work that well, okay? <laughs> and that's true, but you know why? The reason was actually because these walls didn't go all the way up. They almost did that, right? There was like some space here. So if enough of them were ripped up, the, the boats start to tilt. And, and, and when it's, when it's sort of tilt like this, you know, and then the water starts floating over these, like from the next to the next to the next to the next. So the Titanic is really an excellent example of a cascading failure, where you don't have full containment of the error. Really, really. But, but also, once again, I think this is sort of a good example of fault tolerance. I mean, you can get like three, four, five of these ripped up, and you can still, you know, you can still do it, you know, like Rocky. But we can do better, I think. I mean, we can bring resiliency to this. We can actually heal and, and sort of fix these compartments in software. It might be harder in the ship industry. Uh, because we can add what, what I call supervision. Okay? And, and, and supervision is really about having this guy, you know, that, that sort of is usually the guy that sort of, sort of created you. And sort of, but that it's also his responsibility to manage how, you, how, you're, how you're doing, you know, a great boss should like beat people up, you should like, should actually look, look out, look after you, I mean, go in and check in, how, how are you doing, can I help you, I mean, you need a coffee or something like that, right? And, and if, you, if you have that, if you have a, now a way for, for the failure to be contained, signal, observe, and managed by the supervisor, then you actually have a model where you are able to, to, to like heal the failed components and full, be fully resilient, come back, to, to, to like full functionality, to restore full full functionality, and and so the, the way I, I would I would like I like to think about it is is very well illustrated by by a vending machine. I usually try to use this example as a way to illustrate what I mean and what I also how I distinguish between failure and error and why I think they are actually that that distinction is actually important. So think that you have you, that that you have this, this vending machine now. Okay, and, and you have a programmer, he like, yeah, he's been hacking all day, and he's for like 20 minutes and whatever, and then he's really eager for his coffee. So he walks up to the coffee machine and he inserts like, for example, one Swedish kroner, okay? I don't know, what is this, the current, that's euro, right? Yeah, so I don't know, 20 cents or whatever it might cost. Uh, and this coffee machine like says, I mean, take, says like coffee costs two coins, okay? What's going to happen? He will get sort of a notification, say, add more coins. I mean, one is not enough, and he, he, and he adds one more coin, and he gets his coffee. He, like, he fulfilled his part of the contract. You know, add two, and then press brew. So now the next day, let's see, the coffee, the, this, this, this programmer walks up to, this, to the vending machine, and he puts two coins in. And now, let's see, he gets an out of coffee beans error thrown in his face, right? This is not the way it, 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 I mean, the, actually a coffee machine works, right? I mean, what, should the co what, what should this poor programmer do? I mean, there's no coffee machine. Are they like behind, behind the coffee machine? Are there like, is there like some, some, some storage around the corner or something? I mean, what should he do? I mean, he can't do anything useful with this information, right? Or, or if, like, if they order water or something like that. This is just wrong. Instead, what is, I don't know if it's actually the way it works, but in an ideal world, what should work is that you have this service guy running around different floors fixing these machines, and he will get a notification to his to his cell phone or something, or beeper or something like that, that that this 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 particular machine is out of coffee beans now, and then he can actually come in and fix that. He can add more beans, and the programmer doesn't need to do anything. He fulfilled his part of the contract, and he should get his coffee, and now he gets his coffee, and he's happy. 
Okay, I really believe this is the way we should design software. You have the client makes a request. I mean, he sort of in the, in this request is, is part of some protocol. And, and, and if he fulfills his part of the protocol, he gets a response, right? If he doesn't, he gets some sort of validation error. Like, like I mean, you didn't enter a valid email address or, or, or just get out of here. I don't know. And, 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 but if there's like some, some failure with the service, a third party, I mean, database is down or something, that shouldn't be thrown into the client's face. What should he do with that? He doesn't even have a clue that this service is using a third party. Uh, service or something like that, or if it's like, I don't know, can't deal with more requests or something like that. I mean, so sorry, then, then it should be an application failure that is sent up, you know, up to the supervisor. And the supervisor is usually the guy that created the service, or the end number of services here. And he knows now what's happening, and he can actually deal with it. And, and restart the component, or like spin it up on some other node and redirect the user, or something like that, and actually act intelligently about this. So there's a difference between application failure and application errors, I believe. That's actually used, that should be looked as protocol errors, you know, where the user hasn't, hasn't ful ful fulfilled his part of the contract. So what I, what I will try to explain now here is like, it's like what, what I think this is, a, d a description of is what I, 10 minutes left, okay. <laughs> Well, this is, I thought I had one hour, so, but okay. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm getting to my main point here now, anyway. So, uh, now you lost me. <laughs> uh, so, 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 uh, so this is what I call the error kernel pattern. And, 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 and uh, it's, 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 it's sort of about having, sort of, having a way to, that, 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 you, that you grab your, sort of your critical state and you put it inside the innermost of this, of this onion. And then you have layers for protection, right? So, so the way I like to look at it is, that, is that, that you have sort of, you put the critical state in what then I call the error kernel. That's sort of the innermost of this onion, in this onion layered sort of ma failure management. And, 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 uh, and here, I mean, you have sort of these blue things or, 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 the, or so the objects and the red squares are also the, the, the critical state. And then you sort of delegate dangerous work to subordinates. Okay, so you have these sort of layers, you know, these components uh, create com other components that create other components until you get the user-facing components, okay? And, and, and now, if, if the important thing is that each one of these components now need to run in its own thread. So you have so the thread boundary here is like it's actually around each one of these of these components. This means that if 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 a, if a client comes in and and, and 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 does a request and this component fails, it sort of fails completely in isolation. It doesn't bring anything da else down with it, but but a, a notification is sent to his supervisor. But still the client ha ha still doesn't have a clue. He 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 fulfilled his part of the contract. Everything is fine. Okay. And, and now this, 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 this supervisor can, can, can just restart this component, re, I mean, re, resubmission the request here, and, and return the state to the client. And, and the client's happy. But, but, the, the, but, this, but yet again, the key thing to get the model like this where the system is actually able to heal while it's running, without the client even knowing that it's actually doing that, is, is the ability to signal failure. I mean, first, the ability to contain it. In a, in a single thread boundary. I mean, having each component run in a, in a sort of an isolated box in a thread. And then having a way of de like capturing the failure as a message, sending it somewhere upwards to the guy that has no more power. And that, that knows about, have the, have the broader perspective of things and knows why things go, go, go wrong. And have the ability for him to restart the component, restart on another machine perhaps, or, or, or do something. And if in the worst case, like also escalate, right? It might actually be an, an out of memory error. It might be that something that this supervisor can't even deal with. Then, then he continue to escalate it up to someone that hopefully can. In, in an out of memory error, the whole VM will be host. And that is really important why this mechanism, is all, mechanism is also needs to work across machines. So there's always, the failure is never lost. It always goes somewhere to someone that's listening and can deal, can, and can deal with it. And, if, and if, if you remember, this is very much like the story we learned from the, from the, from the Meerkats. 
where, where, the, where the dominant female actually delegates dangerous work to others, to her subordinates. She never does that herself. Same thing here. The error kernel components never ever do, perform to dangerous work. When, when a request hits the error kernel, it can always be assumed to be correct and fully validated and nothing bad can happen. Okay? And it's also very much like, like what we learned that the world is actually functioning today. You have these layers of protection, right, that protects the, the, what's actually important, us, right, as individuals. And in this case, our critical state in the system. Okay, so how much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? <laughs> okay, thanks. So are we done now then? Yeah, I wish, but sorry, we really, we really don't because, because the problem is that this is not sufficient, right? If you remember the lessons we learned from, 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 from like uh, social systems and, 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 and biological systems, we need to maintain diversity and redundancy and we need to have an interconnected network structure. What that really means for software is that we need, we need to run more than one machine, right? If one machine fails, then you're host anyway. We need to have, be having a way to, to like spread out the risk. You know, don't put all the eggs in the, same, in the same basket. And that's also extremely important for, you know, for not just for availability, but also be able just to, to deal with more load, being able to elastically scale out. And then, you know, I mean, the network is, is really reliable, right? We always learn that. No, not really, actually. When we have, it's, as soon as you add the network to, between your components, you're entering a completely different world. Things get way harder because messages, as we know, I mean, they, they are sort of guaranteed within like uh, threads usually, but between the, net, between the network, I mean, you know, they can be like lost, duplicated, reordered, anything bad can happen. And failure detection is like from, from like, like hardcore fact, you know, it, it actually becomes just a guessing game. We have really no clue if a node is down or if it's just doing, being, having, you know, being on the knees now because it's dealing with load or if it's just going and grabbing coffee. <laughs> so, and I really believe that strong consistency here is just too brittle. I mean, we're, we're sort of, we're, our minds, you know, are, are being, we've been spoiled by thinking about things in the strongly consistent world for too long, but it really doesn't work in this, in this new world of, of, of distributed systems. It's just, it's almost impossible to make a strongly consistent fully available, right? It's really how the world works. Nothing in the world is like strongly consistent. We try to think about the system like this in software while what we're trying to model in the real world. The real world is just, simply doesn't function like that. I mean, I did a whole talk about this called Life Beyond the Illusion of Present. Just, and, and if you want to dive down more into that topic. I really believe that resilient protocols need to fully depend on two things. That's asynchronous communication and eventual consistency. Okay? And, 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 and this gives you a way to, to write loosely coupled systems that, that can sort of work in isolation. It's very much, you know, this whole trend towards microservices is very much like that. So you can have each, each, each microservice live and die in isolation, be upgraded in isolation, you know, roll back in isolation. And I really believe that this type of protocols gives us a way to, to write sort of protocol, communication protocols that are tolerant to message loss, message reordering, and message duplication. And, and one sort of funky sort of acronym for this way of thinking is, is, is ACID 2.0. I don't know if you've, if you've heard about that. this. You know, ACID, you know, is at, it's, in the classic sense, it's atomic, consistent isolation and durability. But, but this ACID 2.0 tried to embrace sort of these type of protocols and say that they should be, A stands for associative. This means that they are sort of batch insensitive. You can actually batch them as you want. They should be commutative, meaning that they should be order insensitive. Ordering doesn't matter. They still work. And idempotent means they should be duplication insensitive. It's actually too, okay to, to submit the messages multiple times. And we should not try just like strive for guaranteed delivery because it's, there's really no such thing. And we should not try it for like transactional semantics unless we really, really have to. We should definitely not start there. We might end up there for the really small data set, but we should never start there, I believe. So I really believe that we need systems that are decoupling, first decoupling time. This gives us a sort of concurrency. It can be like concurrence through interleaving or concurrence by running on multiple threads. But the most important thing is that we need systems that are decoupling space. The, 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 because this gives us distribution. This means that the system, the component can actually run in multiple locations and doesn't need to run in the same location at, all the time, right? 
for the client, it doesn't matter where the component is running. And, and, and it can actually move, you know, it can actually be replicated or, or, or scaled out independently of, of the client's perspective. And this is because our systems are, be, are actually decoupled in space and time. And here, reactive principles leads the way. I don't, most people probably heard about reactive, right? And, and this is like the underlying sort of, sort of fundamentals for building systems like this. And, and microservices is one sort of variation of that. Two more slides, then I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> so I really believe that we need to sort of apply this isolation, you know, principle to course of granularity when we're entering the distributed world, right? We need to decompose our system using what I call consistency boundaries. And within a consistency boundary, we can be consistent. But between, we don't have to. And you know, essentially, there's a zoo out there, you know, between. And, 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 and uh, I, can, I can talk a lot about this, but, but, but there is, as I said, I mean, reactive principles leads, leads the way here. I mean, thinking about each one of these components, you know, as a bounded context from DD perspective, that's a great, a great way of modeling this. And microservices also, also gives a real way to do, to do that, I believe. And, 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 with, and the important thing is that within this consistency boundary now, now you, have, you have sort of atomicity. And, 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 and that, that, that means that it needs to like, it can like live, die, and be restarted and in, in complete isolation. And, and it has sort of an atomic view of its, of its, of its, of its data. And the important thing, the, the key to be able to do that, it needs to own its data exclusively. It can't share data with anyone else, right? And as I said, microservices really help here, and, and things like event logging, and, and Akka has a lot of tools there if, you, if you're interested in that, in that type of, 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 of world, but I really believe that we need to apply these type of principles from the smallest component all the way up to the biggest components, whatever that might, might be, might be your microservice or whatever. And uh, I mean, life will be easier actually, not harder. I mean, we can let go of the strong consistency sort of, sort of, um, you know, illusion that that the world works like that. So if I may, if I may, like sum up. Uh, I really believe that the complex systems always run as broken systems. Really, I mean that's sort of one of the most the key insights that we need to fully embrace. I believe there, there was always something failing somewhere in a non-trivial system, and resi resilient is really by design. You need to be part of the way you design software from ground up, from day one, from the first from the day you start modeling. Think about resilience. Think about the failure c conditions and have a, have, a, have a good way of managing that from day one really believe because without resilience nothing else matters thank you